Uh, yeah, he, we're talking about what they want for me. Yeah, we're on the topic that we were before Charles came. Determination. Well, I was we, obviously we, I, I was talking about how Christianity God, how God guides whom He wants and hardens whom He wants. And we yeah, said well, in Islam, that's like an expression. It's not like a literal thing. God doesn't like literally harden people's hearts in real time. It's an that's expression. What Paul says. Yeah, but, but it's, it, it's an expression, not necessarily a... Uh, expression? What does yeah. that even mean? So, like, um, for example, uh, I'm not... Don't, don't take this as me running away, but I'll, I'll come back to it, right? But as an example of this exact same language, we say things that, like, like uh, God... It, it repented God that He made man. The anger of the Lord was kindled against the children of Israel. Um, the wrath of the Lord was, um, was um, shown upon the Amalekites, right? We're using human language to rationalize the actions or the created actions that we see God perform in our reality, right? So the same thing applies for the idea of God hardening somebody's heart. Um, the hardening of, for example, Pharaoh's heart, right, wasn't done in real time by God. But what it showcases is despite Pharaoh's arrogance and lack of humility, God was still able to actualize his ultimate good, which was the freedom of the children of Israel. So in order to write, write that in like a, a, a thematic way, the writer of Exodus says, oh, uh, the, uh, God hardened the heart of Pharaoh. Not to me in a literal, real-time way, but it would seem as though, despite God showing him the ten plagues, and it being mighty and, and it, it, impossible to replicate, he still pursued the people of God. It would seem as though God hardened his heart, or he might be crazy. See, this is that's, my that's the idea. See, this is my problem. I read very explicit scripture. Yes, because you're an athlete. That, that, that's why. Because you're an athlete. Because you're an athlete. That's, that's why. You're an athlete. Of course I am. We. So, okay. Oh, okay, wait. wait. Let, let, me, let me ask you. What makes you think that the Bible is only read literally? Why do you think that? First of all, I'm a human being. Secondly, you, you believe that the Bible is theologically errant, inerrant. Oh, Should, okay. Yeah. So why does that so why is it, literal if readings? If it's theologically inerrant, why do you have to run circles? Like, to, first of all, by what authority are you saying that that's what has actually happened? By, uh, by the authority of the medieval text called the Quadriga. What the heck is even that? The qua <laughs> <laughs> so the Quadriga, <laughs> the Quadriga right, is a group of, of, like, of, of like medieval Christian texts that tell you how to interpret the Bible. And I think it gives, it gives like what time is that? Uh, any time from the fall of Rome. So any time from like, like 440. Okay. Yeah. And you so, that as authoritative. Uh, uh, in, in that, we, this is how we read the Bible anyway. That's why, for example, we know. Yeah. So, okay, let me take one step back. It gives you four ways that you can read the Bible, and I hope I remember all four of them. So one of them is, is uh, literal, one is analogical, one is moral, and one is anagogical, right? Ana yeah, it's like I can, I can anagog or whatever, right? So the things that you read in the Bible fall under one of these categories. So not everything is, is about morality, not everything is analogy, not everything is literal. Right? You have to read the context of the verse to understand why it is literal or, or non-literal. So for example, with Pharaoh, we take this, the scripture where it says, uh, uh, I am the Lord God, I do not change, as being indicative of the essence of God, aka God's uh, immutability, never changingness. So if God does not change, how can God get angry? when anger is a change in emotional states. Well, you can take change to mean very different things. For example, I can say I will never change, but that doesn't mean that I don't go through emotions and every single day. And but emotions are literally changes in your, in, in your like, essentially like emotional states. So, so if you say you don't change, but you have emotions, okay, how, that is a form of change. How strict are we defining change? So if God before creation, there was only God, and then God created man or angels. That's a change then. God, because God did but, an action. But the change is not in God. The change is external to God. 
So God hasn't changed what creation no, has. No, there was no creation, then there was creation. No, God changed his mind. First of all, he, there, he, there was no creation, and then he changed his mind and he said, I'm going to create something. Well, That's a change. So, so no, God does not have changes in mind. Also, what is change? Is change just a change of emotions, or is it a change of speech, or is it... Ch uh, change is moving from uh, potential to actuality. From potential, okay, and how? Okay, so how do you? Do okay. From okay, so if God is not angry and then He becomes angry, that's a change. But I, we say God does not have emotions. Emotions are a human thing. But certainly, if you want to write about God analogically, right, as an analogy. Oh, wait a second. Why is it raining down like hailstones from God? Oh, He must be angry. See, this type of letter G is exactly what I have a problem with. Because you're, you're, you're literally reinterpreting if you, all of Scripture in If you time. literalize all Scripture, then you fall into absurdity. And if you do whatever you do now, uh, uh, yeah, 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 it, it, throw it all... Which is why you don't, which is why, well, why there are certain parts I do not change that can be read, read literally. Yeah. And then there's parts like God being a mighty man of war or a roaring fire or a shield and a buckler that should be read analogically. I don't see, see Yo, once, once again, you, 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 you're, you're, you, you, all you know your authority what? is purely can, philosophical. You can, cannot... I, can I give you an app that can literally just give you commentary from like early fathers on literally every verse in the Bible so you can see it for yourself? Yeah, sure. That would be beneficial. Cool. Because like, like, you think I'm, I'm just here, like, I can't grab an app all day and stuff like that. I'm just making stuff up. I am not, man. Because <laughs> uh, I'm not this good at making things up. Uh, that one there. Oh, so okay. literally for every single verse in the Old and New Testament, you have a citation from a father or multiple fathers. Okay. So, yep. uh, um, uh, uh, catena. catena. So like a, a chain, I think, in Italian or something. Ca yeah. Catena. Ah, Cate catena. Catena. Oh, catena. Catena, yeah. Okay. There. Yeah, but once again, with what your, your authority is purely philosophical when it comes to this. But, so, not doing... but philosophy isn't bad. It's not a bad thing. I don't know why you keep thinking that. It's not a bad thing. No, when I it's say a good thing. Your, your, your theological authority is purely philosophical, that's a bad thing. But it's not purely philosophical. Like, for example, um, okay, so take this for example. You have the Sahaba and the Tabirin, right? And you want to g uh, get insight of what they thought about certain topics from them. Cool. We have the same thing. We, we, we have the disciples and their students. And their students write things. They, they execute the, the Bible. We can go and read that stuff right, right now if we wanted to. So... The, the, the students of... The, uh, for, for, for example, John, you have Polycarp and Irenaeus, and then like... like uh, are they direct disciples of them? Yeah, of, of John, yeah. Okay. And, and then like you have the entire right. like uh, bishopric in, in Alexandria in Egypt today that was started by Mark? Mark, yeah, Mark. You have, you have the bishopric in Ethiopia started by, by Matthew. You have, um, you have the, uh, the one started by Thomas, the apostle uh, in India. Like it's, it's, it's all, all just there. I, I don't, first of all, I don't know the names of the, um, of the like, first three disciples or whatever, of like Mark or whatever, but that, literally just look at the first three patriarchs of a church in Alexandria, and that's them. Yeah, but at the same time, bro, why would you define God being angry as something, as a change? As an analogy, so, because it's just a change. God can be angry with potentially someone there, I was going to say you, but then I said, hey, man. <laughs> not very flattering. Uh, God can be angry with someone over there, but happy with someone over there. Does that mean that okay. God is happy and angry? He's not changed. Okay. So, you as an athlete, you would say if God gets angry, he really gets angry, but in a way that is unlike how human beings get angry. Yeah. Yeah? yeah. Now, here's the problem with this. You've told me that God is doing an action, right? But that action is completely unlike anything we can understand. So God hasn't actually told you what he's doing. He's actually told you nothing. Because if no, I... You understand anger. You but something that how, can you, how can you be angry, how can you understand anger in a way that is unlike any kind of anger human beings have? Because as a concept, it's, this, it's sort of the same concept. Oh, so, so, but you see, now, philosophically, you're saying that there's a similarity in concept and a difference in reality. That's what you're saying. That's philosophy. Yeah, but... See, here's, here's so you do it too. That's, 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 that's what I was pointing out. <laughs> Wait, because no, I want to put. Le, le, I want to. Uh, let me pull the passage. Go ahead. Uh, uh, 
to change my phone now. I had all the references in the other phone. I hope I get find it. If yeah. you saved uh, it. Romans 9:16. Sure. This is different. No tap. This is the same one about about like uh, um, God hardening the hearts, right? Yeah. Yeah. Be yeah. I want to go through it again. Sure. And it's not only that passage. There are other also other passages where you have, for example, in times of war, where God says the Lord will give you victory. Go to war. There are like that. Yeah, another instance it says, don't go to war because the Lord is angry with you. He will not give you victory. Yes. It says, if you obey me, I will bless you. If you disobey me, I will unbless you. Sure. All those things are actual actions. You can't tell me that they're not going there. They're not going to win the war because so. purely based on their free will, they're not going to win. It's just God influencing outcomes in real time. So God is not influencing the outcomes in real time in a proximate sense. Like God is like in the mist suddenly and like he's, he's not now like shooting like lightning bolts at them, right? But God in his infinite knowledge of everything that will occur in our time and space can tell them when and when they cannot act against a certain enemy. Because there's even times in the Bible... Well, they act based on whether he's happy with them or not. It's so not it, based on whether he knows... It, it's not about whether he's happy with them or not. Because, for example, when they were... So, so look, look, look at this, right? Look at this, right? So, God... This is why God does not have changing emotions, right? Number one, God sees everything all in one glance. So, in the time when the children of Israel are being read, uh, uh, led sorry, out of Egypt, God already knows that in less than 40 days, they're going to be worshipping idols and cursing His name. Yeah. But He's still doing it. So, is He, is he happy up until that, that, uh, that like, um, part in human history plays out, then He gets angry and He gets happy again and angry again and happy again and angry again? No. He's already seen it all. So, God is apart from, crea uh, from creation in, the, in his, his eternal presence where he doesn't change, get angry or emotional. However, when certain things occur and we want to like regale the stories back to you, man, God was angry with me, man. A tree fell on my head. That's the way we rationalize it. Okay, hold on. Let's read this again. Go for it. It does not therefore depend on human desire. Because look, what Paul said, what shall we say? Hold on. The older sir, whatever. It does not therefore depend on human desire or effort, but on God's mercy. For sure. scripture says to Pharaoh, I raise you for this very purpose that I might display my power. Sure. For a second, I, I have a, there's a point I'm trying to land here that okay. my name might be proclaimed in all the earth. Therefore, God has mercy on whom he wants and have one whom he wants and he hardens whom he wants to harden. Yep. One of you might say to me, because so Paul, who is theologically inerrant, is addressing the same concern that I'm saying right now, right? He's saying, then why does God blame us for who is able to resist his will? Okay, so Paul, who is theologically inerrant now, is going to give me a response. And he says very explicitly, right, um, for us to resist his will. But who, who are you, a human being, to talk back to God? That's what Paul says. Mm -hmm. So what is formed, say to the one who formed it, why did you make me this mm -hmm. way? Does not the potter have the right to make out of the same lump of clay some pottery for special purposes right. and some for common use? Right. So that is very clearly telling me something which is actually similar to my theology, which, I'm, which is very easy to understand by a lot of people. If you literalize it, sure, it was similar to theology, but we, we don't literalize that. Yeah, but again, who sh whose word should I take? These are very explicit words. These are not something that... You can say well, like, actually, he's using analogies in in those words. So, so he's, 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 he's talking about the potter, but it's yeah, very yeah, explicit. Which analogy. is an analogy, right? Very so explicit. Analogies one. aren't explicit. Very, they're clear. So it, that that would, that would depend on the analogy that's being used, right? But ultimately, God is capable, yes, of fashioning. So, God fashions everything. Um, at least everything, everything, actually, everything in general, actually, everything in general, with like a telos, with a um, a purpose, right? And then the purpose that God fashions us for isn't, for example, to commit evil, which is the, the difference between um, the understanding that you have in Islam and the understanding that we have in Christianity. God does not fashion any of us for evil, but despite our evil, God's, God's will will still be done. And God's will, you can actually, actually see that in uh, 2 Timothy. So this, this is what I mean, right? Because obviously, if you look at this, you probably see it's a contradiction. But if you look at this, right, it says, this is good. And it is pleasing in the sight of God, uh, our Savior, who desires all people to be saved and to come to the knowledge of truth. So if simultaneously God is desiring all people to be saved, but in your conception is creating certain people for the purpose of them to commit evil, so that his, his, uh, his magnitude will be, will be seen on the earth, right? That isn't what we would say. 
We would simply say that everybody is made with a purpose. That purpose is essentially for them to come to God in some capacity, but then out of their own free will, they can then choose to not follow God. And if they do choose to not follow God, ultimately God's ultimate will, so we call this like God's antecedent will, the will that came before the earth was formed, will still play out. Okay. However, okay, let me, let's bring in contrast to a later verse. Okay, all right. Not a later one, actually, the same one. Because this one says God wants to turn everyone in grace, right? Yes. But this one says, for this very reason I raised you up, that I might display my might yes. through you. Yes, yes. Okay, so Pharaoh was not raised. His purpose of living was to display God's might. Expl very explicitly said, once again, because to me, uh, the problem is I'm not just, I don't just want to... Should he, okay, so would, should he, or, or uh, sorry, could there have been another way in which he could have displayed God's might as opposed to going against God. Is that, so if his purpose was to display God's might, yeah. was the way he would do it only by going against God? No. Okay. That's it. Wait, what? That's it. <laughs> That's a good one. So, 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 so like, remember I said, despite what you might choose to do, God's ultimate will was to be played out. Because God has seen everything, nothing surprises Him. Of course, yeah, 100%. Therefore, I raised you up for this very purpose. That I might display my power in you and that my name might be proclaimed in all the earth. Okay. That's a good comeback. I'll give it to you. It's not about a good comeback, man. No, it's, it's not. I understand. Obviously, bro, I'm not here to argue. The thing is okay. with me is when it comes to explicit statements, I have a hair. I have a very hard time explain, getting someone's like uh, what's internalized or understanding with a bottle that goes against very explicit statements. So when I was talking to Chris the other day about free will and he was talking to me about 100%, all of that was going directly against very explicit statements, which is why I had a problem with it. Same here to a degree, making it easy a little bit, but you understand what I mean? When it comes to explicit statements, which is why I'm an athlete, obviously. I, I think you should change that. I think, I think you should change that. I'm obviously always asking you to change that. I'd rather... It, it's not to it, get into it that. It falls into a problem, like, but whatever, whatever. Yeah, but I have... When it comes to explicit statements, that's the thing. You don't... You can't take it oh, too many ways. Question. Does heaven and earth exist now? Sorry, heaven exists? Sure. Or hell? Sure. They are already exist? Yeah, that was like reality, sure. Yeah. Now, now? Yeah. They, they won't be created later. They're yeah. not going to be created later? Yeah. They exist already Yeah. Now. For example, like... Uh, Jesus paradise. Is... Paradise and hell. Sure. Well, what's up? I thought they will be... They, they're not exist yet. So, so... They will so, be exist on the so, destruction of this uh, the, the, There will be a new one, a new heaven and a new earth that will come in after this was wiped away. Yes. Yeah. But there's already one here now. Our, our Father who had in heaven. Like, yeah. Yeah, but that's it, pretty much. Okay, we can talk about the whole athlete thing all, 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 offline, but effectively, it's just like it, it leads to you affirming things that don't have a meaning. That's the issue with this. So, if you affirm things that don't have a meaning to them, if, if I am handsome in a way that is unlike anything that's handsome on the planet, what does that even mean? It means like it's not an example that you've seen before. That's all it means. So then what, so what, what am I telling you? Do you believe that you, there are colors that exist that you haven't seen? Sure. Perfect. But, 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 but then if I tell you I have a coat that is a color you've never seen before, what am I telling you about that coat? What? Oh, yes. One second. Okay, fine. All right, cool. <laughs> you understand, all right. But yeah, yeah, chew on that one. What am I telling you about that coat? All right, one second. We'll all right. Cool. Um, a little conversation about, like, I guess, predestination. It's a, it's a bit of a weird topic um, because of the way that we have sort of made the term predestination a bit more colloquial in this era. Whereas before, a better word that was used was the providence of God. The ability for God to be like a game master or a chess master, where he can see all possible outcomes of all scenarios all in one glance from his infinite presence with no past and no future. So in that capacity, whatever God wills or God's ultimate will, like we can see in 2 Timothy um, 2 verse 3 and 4, 
um, all God wills that all God things will return to him at the end of the day. So whatever we see regarding the idea of God holding the hearts of Pharaoh isn't being done in a literal sense or, or in time, but despite the fact that Pharaoh has, out of his own free will, chosen to disobey God, God's ultimate purpose will still be carried out, despite human error. That's all it simply means. Anyway, God bless.